He's been battling bipolar disorder for the last three decades. We learn about when he first realized that he has this, what he went through and how he is treating it, and the book that he's written about the weapons that he uses to fight his battle against bipolar disorder. Thanks for listening and subscribing to Learning More. It's Russ with you. And this week, well, before we get into the topic, I've got to tell you, this is episode number 50. Yeah, 50 episodes of uh, Learning More. It's kind of crazy uh, that I've got to this point. Uh, So thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. And please continue to do so as uh, we go along through our next 50 episodes here. I started the show because I find all of these topics uh, interesting to me. I, I, years ago, I started uh, basically this idea of, hey, I want to learn something new every single week. And then I said, well, you know what? Let's just turn that into a podcast and I get to talk to cool people. Uh, I, I don't think random people would just tell me their life stories and things like that if it was just me calling them on a phone. So I got to have this podcast to do that. And, uh, you know, you know to, to have you guys listening, well, that's even better. So thank you. Thank you again for uh, listening. Okay. Today, we are going to learn more about bipolar disorder. This is something that I've found interesting because it's, well, it's talked about in, in movies, uh, like the Silver Lining Playbook. It's talked about with celebrities like like Demi Lovato. But what do we really know about it? What is this? And I'm talking with somebody that's actually written a book on it, sharing his experiences of his diagnosis with bipolar disorder. And he is joining me now. Troy, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, you were diagnosed with bipolar and you put this book together. Why is it that you put this book together? Put it together... Um to help myself and to help other people. It's a self-help book about bipolar disorder that um, talks about a battle plan you can follow to stay on track. I was, uh, I had my first bipolar episode in 1993. So I've been dealing with the bipolar disorder for quite a while. How, how old were um, you when you, when you first experienced that? I was 31, um, married at the time, had three kids. So I'm an engineer, always wanted to write a book and they say, write what you know about. So I right. tried to <laughs> kind of write a process you could follow, mm-hmm. a plan you could follow to stay, keep from um, having bipolar be too disastrous to your life. And that's in your book, which is called uh, Breaking Bipolar. Uh, we'll, we'll put a link to that in the podcast description. I, I want to go back to 1993. What were some of the first symptoms that you experienced? I started getting paranoid. Um, having some hallucinations, uh, wasn't getting along with my wife at the time, be totally transparent. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, she's a nurse and I actually would wake up in the morning and have a pain in my back, a real bad pain. And I thought she was giving me shots while I was sleeping, mm. which was totally off the wall. Um, and it just kind of snowballed to where I got more and more paranoid, um, started sleeping downstairs in the lazy boy and got to the point where, I was like, I don't know what the heck's going on with me, but I'm going to, I'm going to take off down to Florida and go into a motel and try to figure out what's going on and regroup. Uh, I got a few hours out of town and I started to say to myself, you know, I was going to miss my children. What's going on? So I went back to, I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina at the time. So I went back to Raleigh and went into the, I checked myself into, well, not checked myself. I went into the emergency room of a re- regular hospital. Mm-hmm all of what was going on in my, my mind and they took me to a uh, transported me to a mental hospital psychiatric hospital where I checked myself in and um, that was my first episode hmm. you know a bipolar episode is really can be uh, defined as things are going really bad you know you're getting real manic or really depressed and if you don't do something you're going to go off the rails mm-hmm so you've got kind of two areas that you're experiencing. You're experiencing the depression, but then there's times where you're kind of high on life, fast thinking, things like that. Is Was that happening as, as well? Both sides of that? Yeah. I mean, different people experience bipolar in different manners. Mine is where I get mania first. I start getting more and more manic mm-hmm. and then uh, it crash and burn and then get depressed. So it's a uh, kind of a cycle, you know, the mania might last for 
a week where you're getting more and more manic. And then, um, you know, you crash into depression, which lasts longer than mania, usually, it's, you know, weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. Other people just, just get hypomania and then mm -hmm. they get depressed. So when you went into the emergency room, uh, did they um, immediately diagnose you with this or did it take some time before you, you figured out what was going on? Um, you know, I, I probably waited about a half an hour from when I got in there and then I sat down with the doctor and described what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so probably within the hour of me going to the regular hospital, I was transported in an ambulance to a psychiatric hospital mm -hmm. and, um, actually had a psychotic break in the hospital. It was there about three weeks and then, um, you know, Went home from there, trying to figure out what the hell heck happened to my life. Right. Pretty much changed my frame of mind forever. Did you at any point figure like or or look into or do you have kind of like an idea of sort of where this came from? Because it, it, did, did you have parents or relatives that suffered from this as well? Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of times bipolar disorder is hereditary and my dad was... My dad had bipolar disorder. Okay. Um, he never really got treated for it or took medication, mm -hmm. um, but he would have ha extreme highs and lows. Yeah, when you started to recognize this, and it's interesting that it took, it, it, it was until you were 31. Do you think that you actually had symptoms prior to that, that you maybe didn't recognize? Yeah, I think so. Um, I remember a time in college, I was going to Purdue University it was my last year in college and um, I had to stay an extra semester to get enough credits to graduate. So I was living by myself and I was, I remember being depressed at the time. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure living by yourself, going through this, it, it had to be pretty difficult. You know, one of the things that I read about uh, in, in doing the research for this interview I saw that uh, people with bipolar disorder generally uh, partake in risky behaviors. Uh, did you see that with yourself? Yeah, along the way, you know, um, you know, trying to have lots of sex, being risky that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I smoked pot quite a bit in my life, so I was kind of maybe self-medicating on marijuana, uh, drinking like that. I'm sure it, you know, it had, had the effects, you know, be, mm -hmm. to make, to go into an episode, it usually is like a, a stress point where you reach a certain level of stress, what's going on in your life. And it's not, um, it's kind of like sometimes instantaneous where you are in a, you're feeling fine. And then all of a sudden it's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, where you're right. Yeah, I've heard you're that. another person almost. Yeah. yeah I've, I've heard that. And, and as you know, I do reading on this and researching on this, uh, I saw a lot of that. And actually as far as the becoming ill, um, some of the risk factors for that were, you know, maladaptive coping, alcohol or drug use, irregular daily activities, interpersonal conflicts, stressful situations. It's all these, you know, things that, that you mentioned here. And I'd like to talk though about the treatment. What treatment did you receive? Yeah. Um, I was definitely heavily medicated once I got into the hospital and had a psychotic break. Mm-hmm. So medication, I've been on medication since then to this this day. Uh, a few times I went, tried to go off it and then ended up having another episode. It was just not a good idea to just quit taking all your medicine all right. at once. Yeah. Um, but there's also, you know, in the hospital, they have like group therapy. You talk to your psychiatrist. Uh, they give out handouts so that you try to learn about it as much as you can. Uh, a lot of times people are resistant like I was, I, you know, I was like, no way am I going to go into group therapy and start talking about this. But I eventually uh, actually started going to the bipolar support group meetings, which have been very helpful because you're around people that have experienced some of the same things and you hear them talk about their experiences and you, you know, kind of like, kind of like an AA meeting, but it's a bipolar support group meeting mm -hmm. that, um, that are helpful. 
What else have you found helpful? Pretty much trying to follow a, a whole life wellness plan. Like in your book. You know, that's what my book is about. Yeah. <laughs> the battle plan is based on the expert recommendations of the medical community. Great. Okay. Let's, let's get into that a little bit. Like my plan, I'll go ahead and just say what the, the different weapons are in my plan. There's a contingency plan where it's like an emergency plan. If you start going off the rails, uh, enemy recon is learn as much as you can about the illness, op- optimize your medication to where there's, you know, there's a process you can follow on taking your meds to, to ramp up the meds and ramp down the meds and figure out what's the optimal dosages. Find, next weapon, find the right psychiatrist. Next weapon, train your mind. Uh, train your body, which is like exercise. Um, you know, breathing techniques and so on. I have a weapon called recovering from an episode. What you can do once you recover from an episode and you're back at home. And then psychiatric hospitals, what they're like. It's it's very helpful, helps them know what you what it's going to be like when you're in a hospital. Right. And then, then legal rights is the final weapon, which can be very helpful from uh, like the American Disabilities Act. If you're, if you're at work that you can uh, maybe take recourse if they, if they fire you and other legal things, like if someone is trying to maybe have you involuntarily, admitted to a psychi- psychiatric hospital. Mm, it's kind of mm-hmm. like what they call the Baker Act. Yeah, in Florida, right. And so knowing your legal rights can be very helpful. Yeah, the, in Florida, they have the Baker Act uh, that I think it was back in 1971 or so. This is the pleasures of doing a, a daily history show that I did for so long. <laughs> I get to learn all these random facts. Uh, but basically, yeah, you, you can be uh, examined for up to 72 hours uh, if they think you have some sort of um, medical illness, there's various forms of this act throughout the United States. Thinking about, though, your your book, going going into that and talking about how you call these various weapons, the, the legal weapon of just knowing your rights and knowing what you need to defend yourself against. Uh, thinking about all these weapons, when did you first decide to use these? It took me several years. I I was resistant at the beginning thinking to myself, okay, I'm on this medication, but now I'm feeling fine. Why am I taking all these meds? You know, talking to the doctor, like, let's adjust the medications. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thinking to myself, um, you know, basically throughout the years, I would be like, I'm not optimal. I'm taking these meds. I'm doing these other things. I I was still working. I worked as an aerospace engineer all the while. And, um, you know, I go and see my doctor and like, I'm not optimal. I'm not optimal. And then I started to put this plan into, into effect to where, um, I was able to do all these different things. And then I was able to, you know, like I said, there's the, one of the most powerful weapons is optimize your medication because you might be on three or four different medications and you're talking to your doctor and, He says, okay, well, let's take you off this one and we'll put you on a new one. Well, the one that he takes you off of, you might be taking like 400 milligram gram tablets, you know, every Mm -hmm. day. And you're supposed to ramp it down slowly. So he says, okay, ramp it from 400 to 300. Do that for two weeks. Two weeks later, ramp it to 200 and so on until you're off that med. And at the same time, you're bringing up a new med. He'll start you at 100 milligrams. Oh, for two wow. weeks, go to, go to 200. Mm-hmm. And when you get to 400 in a month and a half, come back and see me. And uh, as you can tell, that's a very, it's not an easy thing to do. And along the way, you're experiencing different emotions and, and um, you know, trying to c- come up with the right medication plan. But all of these things together, until I did all these things together, I wasn't able to get to the point where I go see my doctor and say, Hey, I feel good. Nice. Nothing's going wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Prescribe my meds. I'll see you in three months. Right. How long did that take? So we're saying this started in like what? 93 is what you said, I believe. Uh, yeah. It's a, how long did that take? It took a long time. Um, I had a second bipolar episode in 2005. Mm-hmm where I quit taking my medicines, I started getting manic and 
thought people thought like some were following me around and were going to shoot me more, more and more manic. I ended up actually stopped taking the medicine. And about two weeks later, I quit going to work. And then I actually swallowed a bunch of pills and um, ended up in the hospital. So that was 2005. And, you know, at, by that point in time, I, I, I accepted I needed to take medication and, you know, quit fighting it and start trying to make it work better. Um, I had another episode in 2015 and I was out in LA actually working at, as a, at an engineering job and um, started getting more manic. This was, a, this might be interesting to some people. I was, I was on a medicine, uh, taking Adderall, which is a controlled substance. So I was living in Connecticut, working for Sikorsky Helicopters. Uh, that job ended. I was a contractor, so I worked there two years. The job ended. I picked up cross country and I got a job in LA for an engineering company. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on three or four different medicines at the time. One of them was the Adderall. So I get to California and I go see a psychiatrist. Well, I, I was being prescribed the medication from my doctor in Connecticut. And then when I got there to LA, you know, I was supposed to go find a new doctor, but he would go ahead and um, continue prescribing my meds for about two or three months. Well, he wasn't able to prescribe the Adderall because it's a controlled substance. So after that happened and I quit taking Adderall for about a week, I started getting manic and, and um, again, threw away all my medicines into oh, a wow. in the field along with my cell phone, started taking the bus around LA and um, ended up being involuntary admitted to a psychiatric hospital then. So that was my third major episode that happened. And since then I started writing my book and it started following the plan. I've been good since then, knock on wood. And um, I'm, I feel lucky to be where I'm at right now. Oh yeah. You couldn't take the, you couldn't take the drug cause you moved to a different state. Like that's, and, and you, after just describing to me how long it takes to remove one drug and replace with another to just try to snap fix it like that, that that's doesn't seem, <laughs> it doesn't seem like a great plan. You'd think uh, there would be something amongst the States that would be able to help out with that. But, uh, well, you know, it's, I, it's looking crazy. back, I should have tried to get a psychiatrist in California right away. You know, oh, so right, then, to get the prescriptions set up. But I, yeah. you know, wow. I didn't do that. So it bit me in the, Right. Well, how, how would you even know, you know, like these are things and that, that and that's why I find it great that you're putting together this book, because these are things that somebody that's going through this, they might do that same move for something similar and they might, they're not going to think about that. Like I wouldn't think about that if it was me. There's so many things that, you know, it, it, helpful advice that you can give because you've been there, done that and you've, you've, you know, gone through it. Now we, we talked about how your dad had this and we, you also mentioned that it, uh, you have kids. Uh, are they showing symptoms of this or is there a concern for that? Yeah, that's a good question. I have four kids. They live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, my youngest daughter, I would definitely say she's exhibiting signs of bipolar disorder. Um, I've tried to talk to her about it and her mom. Uh, so far, she hasn't went to, you know, went to accepted that she needs to get medication but um, she's definitely having issues. I got to ask you this one. If somebody's listening now, you know, I mean, the, obviously the title of the podcast today was bipolar disorder. So if somebody is, is potentially thinking that they may have this or that uh, a loved one might have this, like what's their next step? The problem with bipolar disorder is it can get nasty really quick. So if you're having symptoms that, that are, you know, dangerous symptoms like thinking about killing yourself. Statistics show that about 20% of people who are bipolar commit suicide mm. and 40 to 60% actually attempt suicide once in their lives. So, you know, two, two out of 10 people that have bipolar disorder kill themselves. Wow. And that's tragic. Wow. Yeah, I, I had I'd seen some stats, 
but that that just that blows me away that that's that high two out of ten that's insane that's just that's such a high number that I mean you, you've you've got to if you, if you are seeing the symptoms I mean you know try to see somebody as as quick as you can go oh, see a psychiatrist move move yeah. as as quickly as you can to get that done or to, to talk to somebody talk them through it and and see if if you know you can be of assistance in that um and also there's this great book by by <laughs> Troy Stephen that you can check out uh breaking bipolar that it's got the plan so this is something um that is available i'm assuming it's on amazon it's it's in various sources where can people get your book yes it's on amazon it's on uh it's in Barnes and Noble. Um, the I have an ebook, paperback, hardcover, and audio book, all on Amazon and a bunch of other stores. That's great. That's great. So I will link to that in the podcast description. I will say that if you're listening to this, you're not alone with this um, condition. Uh, if you if you think you have this, it's definitely do seek out help. Talk to a psychologist. But, you know, you are not alone on this. There's a lot of people that have this. There's there's even there's been a lot of famous people as well. Right, Troy? Um, Winston Ch- Churchill. Um, like you said, Demi Lovato, Mariah Carey, John Claude Van Damme, Marilyn Monroe. So all of these famous people that, you know, made inroads in life and did great things in their life were able to manage the illness. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the main things I say in my book is, is bipolar heal thyself. It's up to you to take responsibility for your illness. No one else is going to do it for us. And you can make your dreams come true. You know, follow a battle plan, do a whole life wellness plan, make it happen. You can do it. Yeah, that's a great message. And, you know, I will I'll add to that list, the celebrity list there is uh, Kanye West. He says that he has bipolar disorder. He calls it his superpower. If you've got this, you can get through it. And Troy, uh, your book and your message is hopefully helping so many people. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. And thank you for listening, subscribing to Learning More, 50 episodes in. Hopefully you're around for the next 50. We encourage you and thank you for rating the podcast and sharing it with friends. As with many podcasts that give medical or legal opinion, the information is not meant to substitute professional advice. And we encourage you to consult a professional to discuss your exact situation. On the next Learning More, we are going to talk about caregiver burnout. Yeah, earlier in this season, we talked about taking care of either family, taking care of friends. It can be rough and depression is huge amongst caregivers. So we're going to talk about caregiver burnout on the next Learning More. If you've got something that you would like to learn more about, let us know and it just might become a future episode. Submit your ideas and comments at learningmorepodcast.com. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. I'm Russ and I look forward to learning more with you next time.